I have a question. Some people um, say they can talk to plants, and I'm wondering how your theory explains this. Well, anybody can talk to plants. It's just whether or not the plants answer. You know, that's, that's the hard part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you can interact with a plant, and anyone who's done any research in there will tell you that if you love your plants, they will grow better and flourish than if you don't. If you dislike your plants and think they're a nuisance and so on, and you don't really care much about them and ignore them, they won't grow very well. They'll be very, uh, you know, they won't be very happy plants. So yes, your influence you know, will, will work with plants. So there's two things going on there. One thing is whether you have a positive attitude towards your plant and you love your plant means you are modifying the future probability that that plant will do well and grow because you're putting positive energy toward that plant. So then you're the one creating the response of the plant to grow and flourish because you love your plant. So that's one of the mechanisms going on. Besides that, the plant itself has a, an awareness, but that I don't go as far as to say that it has consciousness. Now, that's just me and the way I'm defining things. That isn't fundamental. You know, you can define consciousness a little differently and include the plants if you wish, but my definition, and I, I pick my definition because it's a definition that most people understand intuitively. And if you give plants consciousness and it raises all kinds of other problems and people don't really understand the subtleties of the problems and whatever, you know, so it's, I find it's just a better communication to make my definition such that if you have a zero decision space, you're not conscious. In other words, you have to be able to make decisions with free will. I can go this way or that way. Now, plants, of course, do things that look like they are smart. They follow the sun, you know, but that's not necessarily because they make a decision to follow the sun. That's because the side of the stalk that gets the sun, you know, contracts, and the side of the stalk that gets the shade relaxes, and it just moves the thing. To, you know, it's just a hardwired reaction, and it's the same with some other life forms, you know. Uh, I always, in my book, I talk about the clams, right? But, you know, we don't really know whether clams are conscious or not unless you work with clams enough that you can, like, teach them to do something. If you can teach them to go through a maze or teach them to select certain things, you know, press the red button instead of the green button when the, when the bell goes off, you know, this sort of thing, then that's a decision they'd have to make. That's not just hardwired to them which button to push when the bell goes off if you can train them to do something. Well, I don't know if anybody has ever taken a bunch of clams and tried to train them to do anything in particular. So I don't know where the clams are conscious, but a lot of things are hardwired, where if you do this, you know, stimulus response. And there's a certain, with plants, living things, there's a certain awareness involved in the plant that it has. It's not making decisions, so it's not conscious. It's not saying I'll do this or I'll do that, but it's just aware kind of what's going on aware of its environment to some limited thing and it's not processing that environment it's not making judgments it's not making choices it's just awareness without choice to act on that awareness but you can still have awareness without the choice the choice is another thing so that's the category that I put plants in and if it's aware it probably has awareness that this is a nice supportive environment and awareness that this environment is nasty I don't want to be here so besides the fact that you, the human that loves the plant or hates the plant, change the probability distribution about how the plant goes, there's also the plant that probably has this awareness of whether it's hated or loved and reacts appropriately. Okay? It probably shrinks from the, from the scorn and you know, blossoms to the, you know, to the caring. So both of those are going on and they're both kind of separate functions. So the people who have green thumbs, which means everything they do with plants, the plants flourish. It's because they care for the plants. They have a real caring to that plant. They probably talk to the plants, you know, that's their lovely little darlings, you know, in the, in the soil outside. And they're happy to go there and tend those plants. And they have all this positive energy toward the plants. And the plants respond by just growing and doing really well and making prized tomatoes, you know, at the fair and other, other sorts of things because the people like the plants and those that don't care won't water their plants, you know, they, they're just not nice to them because they just don't care that much. 
Well, the plants probably get that, and they react to that, and they're not too excited about being there either, you know. So, so yes, there is a communication you can have with a plant. And there's a book written about the secret life of plants by Clive Baxter. There he did a lot of experiments with plants and their reactions to things. And most of those I would explain by just plants having an awareness. So they do have some sort of a reaction, but they're not making a lot of choices about it. Now, if research proves that not the case, that they do make choices about it, you can teach the plant to push the red button or the green button or, you know, wave its leaf this way or that way based on the stimulus that you give it, which shows that it's actually making a choice what to do. I would change my mind and I would say plants are conscious just like anything else because they would e exhibit a choice making. And a choice doesn't have to be a complicated choice. It could just be a very simple rudimentary choice rather than a, a kind of a hardwired reaction. And if that's the case, then I would say plants were conscious. So it's not really a, you know, a theoretical aspect of MBT to say that plants are not conscious. It's mainly a, uh, an aspect of the way I define consciousness and whether or not plants have been shown to uh, respond in a way that is choice driven rather than a way is hardwired driven. And I'd say the same thing with clams, you know, I don't know. Now I know some insects are conscious because I've watched them stalk their, you know, their prey. I've watched them make decisions and do things based on what something else did. Something else goes this way, it goes that way. You know, and you can see that it is making choices and it's not entirely hardwired. I mean, some of that behavior might be hardwired too, but you can tell when odd things happen and you get a very intelligent response to that, our, that odd thing and you see that over and over again. That bug is taking in data, processing the data, making a choice and that uh, so bugs are, bugs tend to have conscious. Now, I don't know about all bugs, you know, some bugs. You know, I watched a, a bumblebee stalk my father once. He, he was out swatting a bumblebee and the bumblebee went after him and he ran inside and shut the screen door and he stood inside and that bumblebee went up just above the door where he couldn't see it and hovered and hovered and waited. And I'm sitting on the porch, you know, watching all this and, and very intrigued by it. And that bumblebee stayed up there for, I'd say, at least five minutes. I mean, a long time. So this took focus. You know, a bumblebee who, you know, could only focus for a few seconds and then goes off and does something else. This bee was focused. He stayed up there for a long time. And then when my dad thought it was safe, he opened the door and he went out and wham, got him right on the back of the neck. So that, to me, was premeditated. You know, that, that would pass in a court of law, I think, as premeditated. And anything is premeditated is a conscious choice. So I think bumblebees. Now I don't know. I've never researched bumblebees and tried to train them to push buttons or go through mazes or do anything either. But from that, I would guess that they make choices. You know, so if a bumblebee can do it, why not? You know, a praying mantis or an ant or something else. There's definitely, there's hard wiring. There's hard wiring with us. We have instincts too that drive us. We react out of hard wiring to a lot of things, but. We also have free will and make choices too. So the hard wiring and free will aren't like in either or. It's a mixed bag of those for everything. Just another question that you brought up there. Would you say that most of our choices are from, you know, our hard wiring, just genetic? Some of our choices are. I wouldn't say most. It kind of depends on what you're doing. But some of our choices are hardwired. And, uh, you know, and most of them, I think, probably are not. Depends on what you're doing and what your choices are revolving around. But we have instincts. You know, we're an animal, just like all the other animals. You know, it's the Homo sapiens. That's an animal, and it uh, has instincts like other animals do. You've evolved, and there's certain patterns that evolve that help you survive and help you procreate. And in those areas of survival and procreation is where most of our instincts lie, because that's that's the hard wiring. All the rest of it, we tend to make more choices, but we get some hardwired patterns that have shown over the last two million years that it's more survivable and you can more successfully procreate if you're this way, and we're just hardwired that way. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't overcome it. You can overcome your hardwiring. It's not that you're forced to do it. You're not a slave to it, but that's your tendency. That's your inclination. That's where you move toward, you know, because that's just innate. And an, an animal, you know, a, a bear or a dog can overcome their hard wiring too. You know, but uh, we have some of that. We have instincts and 
that's our proclivity. That's the way we go. And it takes a little effort to not go that way, you know, to overcome those instincts. Does that mean that uh, plants and bumblebees have a place in the non-physical reality? Uh, in other words, are they uh, consciousness that belongs not only to this reality, but also they are consciousness of, uh, outside the um, yes. this reality? Yes, absolutely. Anything that's conscious exists in the non-physical. That's where all consciousness is. There is, no, there is nothing conscious in the virtual reality, just like there's nothing conscious in the World of Warcraft set. All the consciousness is outside of this reality. In fact, consciousness can't be in the same reality as the avatar. See, the avatar can't create consciousness. So the avatar of the elf in World of Warcraft, the consciousness for that has to be outside of the World of Warcraft theme park or the World of Warcraft set. You know, the World of Warcraft has its own little world and consciousness can't be in that world. It has to be outside that world. And here we have this virtual world and consciousness exists in a non-physical. Consciousness is You know, the, vis the virtual reality is the simulation of what's physical. Consciousness is not just information. Consciousness processes, does things with information. It doesn't just exhibit. So consciousness is outside virtual reality. And if you have a conscious bumblebee, then that bumblebee has a non-physical part that is that consciousness making those choices. So it's not the physics, that choice of the bumblebee is not made in a physical sense, it's made in a, in a, you know, a sense. So does the bumblebee have a soul, you know, that sort of thing? Yes, but it might be a group soul. It may be that that bumblebee isn't likely to learn a whole lot of lessons on its own. It may be as part of a group that have certain characteristics. So that'd be like you having 10 elves and you kind of play them all together. You know, they all fight as a team, they all, fight or they all run, they, you know, they all do the way you want them to do and they'd have your one conscious but you'd be working a bunch of players. So it could be that kind of a, a thing with bumblebees. So that's, you know, and when I just say could be, you know, the, the system again can configure itself whatever way is most profitable for itself. If it's more profitable for it to, you know, let bumblebees uh, evolve individually then that's what it does. If it's more profitable for them to evolve as a group then that's what it does, and it's a matter of, of resources. If it's individual, now you have resources dedicated to every bumblebee. If it's group, then you have resources dedicated to a group of bumblebees. You see, so one's more cost effective is, than the other. So you, the system will do whatever is most cost effective as far as resources versus return gained and in, in entropy reduction. So it could be here you have one particularly smart bumblebee that knew how to whack this guy that was out trying to, you know, to swat it. And maybe that bumblebee would uh, get an individual, you know, uh, uh, consciousness for that because it was maybe uh, one of those that is out in the front, evolving, making choices better than others. So maybe that would have an individual and maybe others wouldn't. So it doesn't have to be all this way or all that way. Well, however the system finds it to be cost effective, You know, effective. However, the system finds it to be efficient, that's probably the way it works, and that's probably very fluid. It can change time to time. Same with us. There's those of us walking around here on this planet that have no clue, have no interest in having a clue, and uh, there's no reason to spend a lot of resources sending them stuff in their intuition because they never pay any attention to it, right? So there's not as much going on there. They could just as easily be worked with a group as well, too just like the bumblebees. And here's somebody else who's just really aware and really plugged in and learning and growing. And it may have several entities in the non-physical working with that entity, helping them, giving them uh, you know, uh, little things to egg them on to help expand their consciousness. It may be a group effort. So now you might have somebody with has a couple of non-physical things helping them out other than just maybe their IUOC. So it just depends. The system is going to place resources where they do the most good. In no sense throwing, throwing resources at something that isn't working. So you know, it works for people the same as it works for bumblebees. So to what extent uh, can we say that a living entity is consciousness? Um, I'm thinking about um, probably um, bacteria, amoeba, yeah. or 
even sells. Um, yeah, it's it's to the extent that they have a non-zero decision space. Okay, if they can make decisions, if presented a situation, they have the free will to choose to make a choice. Then I call that consciousness. Maybe very dim. Now let's you know, and the only way to tell whether that's consciousness or hardwiring is to do some research to find out can they respond individually to things. So if a human cell can make choices of how it gets information and how it passes it on, and it can choose to do this or not do this, and it's not hardwired because you can get it to react to unusual circumstances and see how it reacts, and it always, well, I shouldn't say it always, it sometimes reacts that way and sometimes different based on circumstances. It gets hard to determine what's hardwired and what's not. You know, it gets very tricky because you have little things you can't ask them. Hey, you know, hello down there. You know, it doesn't work. So it's very hard for us to find out on this lower level whether they're conscious or not. I suspect a lot of things are probably just maybe aware but not conscious, but who knows until we actually do the research and see if we get an a independent response rather than just a hardwiring will always do the same thing. Stimulus response, stimulus response. It's hardwired. You do this, it'll do that. You know, sort of when your doctor puts your knee up there and he hits it with the hammer and the leg flies out. You know, it's not a, it's not a decision. That's just a hardwired response. And if that's all you get, then it always works the same way. But if you can get it to do things, like you'd learn, teach it to do a maze or something, and that's probably not a hardwired response. That takes choice to figure things out. Then you change the maze and see how long it takes to learn it. And now it does that second maze in a quarter of the time it did the first maze. Well, it's learned something that could be hardwired, but now it's looking less likely. So we don't know. There's a whole lot of things I don't know. So I, I don't say, a lot of people do say, cells are all individually conscious. You know, amoebas are all individually conscious. I don't know whether they are or not because the research hadn't been done to actually show where they make decisions. And that's my definition of conscious is, does it have a finite decision space and actually make choices? Other than that, I'd be willing to say it's maybe aware of things, but if it can't make decisions, then it can't express that awareness. It's just awareness that's unexpressed.